all show long, I've been talking about our eternal damnation in social media hell. Well, my first guest has been to hell and back, all right? He's the president and co-founder of the Center for Humane Technology and was featured in the groundbreaking documentary The Social Dilemma on Netflix. Great documentary. He's also the host of the Your Undivided Attention podcast. Please welcome Tristan <laughs> Harris. Hey, What's up, my brother? Good, man. How are you? Simple question. Is social media the devil? Uh, you're not wrong. I think that it, uh... It, it preys on the worst of human nature and vulnerabilities. In fact, people don't know this, but the founder of LinkedIn said that every successful social media app preys on one or more of the seven deadly sins. Yeah, you so, were telling so, me that. So if the devil is the seven deadly sins, you know, greed, lust, uh, you know, wrath, anger, these are the things that are the powering social media success. Because, you know, how much have you paid for Facebook or Instagram, like, recently? Nothing. Nothing. So then how do they make you know, billions of dollars? Because we're the product, not the customer, but specifically our emotions. It's like the exon of, of the human vices, right? It pumps up our wrath, our anger, our jealousy, our voyeurism, our comparison, because those are the things that work at getting human attention. Jesus Christ. <laughs> no, I really mean that. Jesus Christ, bring Jesus in the room. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Jeez. Now, so what is social media doing to us as humans? Because it just, you know, you go on there and you just don't feel right sometimes when you get off. Totally. Well, I mean, the question is, like, do these people who, when their goal is, is getting the most attention and growth and engagement, that's what Francis Haugen, the whistleblower, was showing, like, over and over again, these companies, social media comes in. By the way, it's not just Facebook, TikTok, Snapchat, the same thing, because they all prey on it. And they profit when they, when they get these human vices to come up in ourselves. And look, I mean, we have comparison and, and beauty, you know, concerns about beauty and validation. That all exists in us. But it's one thing when you have literally a trillion dollars of a company that's pointing an AI at your brain to find the next human vice and like make that rise to the surface. And then when it comes to democracy, it's like, what, what does it want to put at the center of our attention? Well, the, the fault lines of our society. So, you know, we already have these wounds in our society, these historical wounds. But imagine you have a trillion dollar AI that says, I'm going to put at the center of attention the next wound and then open it up again. Right? And that's what it does. That's what Twitter does. That's what TikTok does. That's what Facebook does. You know, it's crazy because sometimes you just think it's people, right? Right. But no, this is actually programming. Right. I mean, it is people, but they're just, like you said, they're magnifying our insecurity. Totally. Well, and so, you know, behind the screen, behind the slab of glass, like there's a thousand engineers who go to work every day and they're not like twisting their mustache saying like, how do I make your life awful? I don't believe that. <laughs> well, Evil! Well, actually, so to your point, to your point, I mean, what we know about from Francis Haugen's whistleblowing is that um, Facebook's own research shows that they know it puts teenagers in a downward spiral, right? That you use it when you're depressed and they know that depressed people, they tend to look at this certain especially like the anorexia kind of videos. Mm -hmm. And by the way, people think, okay, well, we've always had kids uh, and girls compare themselves to others based on beauty. But we didn't have it so that if you clicked on a dieting tip or food tip or nutrition tip, that's what these girls start with. They just click on something innocuous. But then Facebook says with their trillion dollar computer, like what tends to keep people who click on the diet tips and the food tips? And it's like, oh, there's this weird category of video called like anorexia videos. We don't know why that works. In fact, the computer doesn't know what the word anorexia means. It just knows, let's dose those kids with that every day. And the thing is, it's not an individual choice, right? Because if, if the teenager sees the social dilemma, they say, I don't want to use this anymore. They, they can't choose not to use it as easily because it's like, if you to the devil, it's like it's captured all your friends. So if all your friends have been like sucked into this like devil world, and you can't use it if, if you're not going to connect with them, right? Y'all see that weird smoke that's just coming through the room right now? <laughs> is, these, is that just me? I, is what? His ears. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I mean, that was it. I mean, now, where is this going in the next five years? Because this don't feel sustainable, man. Yeah. Well, it's not sustainable. And, and the, I mean, notice, like, I grew up with, with technology. You know, my, my co-founder at the Center for Humane Technology, his dad actually started the Macintosh project at Apple. I think we have very positive ideas about what technology can add to our lives. The key is not whether technology is good or bad. It's are these business models that treat us as the user, not the product. Mm. Where does that take us? And the problem is that this business model is very successful. And, it, and so, you know, it's when, when Justin, in the film, the guy who made the like button, he says in the film, The Social Dilemma, uh, so long as a whale is worth more dead than alive, and a tree is worth more as two by fours, as lumber, dead slabs of wood, than as a tree, in this model, when we're the product to Facebook, TikTok, et cetera, we're the whale, we're the tree. We're worth more as a dead slab of predictable human behavior. When you're doing this with your phone, that's the commodified like lumber of human behavior. My God. When we're commodified into being addicted, distracted, polarized, narcissistic, and misinformed, 
all of those things are the success cases of that business model. Now we could take that business model and throw it out of the entire app stores of all this stuff and we would live in a much better society. And that's what we can do. And that's what I hope Frances Haugen, you know, her testimony on Capitol Hill last week, I hope we can, we can do that. So, so what do you think should happen next? I mean, you know, as, as you said, we, we need regulation, mm -hmm. right? And when we say that, we don't mean it. It's funny because Facebook actually right now is planting these false stories saying that Francis Haugen wants to censor speech and that this whole thing about regulation is a way for government to control speech. But actually, but as you said, it's not about freedom of speech. It's about freedom of reach and dangerous reach. That's right. And we know that the worst of human emotions go way more viral than when we say something calm, right? Like, the one time the vaccine leads to a blood clot and someone dies, that story goes right. viral to, to a billion people. <laughs> and all you need is one story for everybody one. to believe it. You just need yeah. one of those, and everyone reshares it. And it, all the million times that someone got a vaccine and then they moved on with their lives and they're doing everything else, there aren't stories about that. Mm -hmm. Those aren't going viral. So there's this huge asymmetry between what is incendiary and what is truth. And as Sandy says in the film, the truth is boring. Mm -hmm. And so how do we live in a world where we're, we're calmer? We realize we've been put through this sort of bad trip of social media. Yeah, I say it all the time. Nobody cares about the truth when the lie is more entertaining. Exactly. Yeah, and everybody just wants to be entertained on social media. That's right. Now, now why does it seem like technology is outsmarting us? Like, it's like, like you just said, we can't escape fake news. Right. Like you would think like, uh, we would be smarter. Like, why are news reporters and actual news stations reporting the fake news that's on social media? Well, it, it creates this sort of double bind. Like if, if a story goes viral and it's like a conspiracy theory, then if you don't report it, like let's say some conspiracy goes viral, right? Um, then if the media, the mainstream media doesn't report on it, well, it's a conspiracy theory. Look, we know the story went viral. Everyone's talking about it, but the media isn't reporting on it. So therefore it must be a conspiracy theory. But then if they do report it, they are promoting the conspiracy oh, theory. Yeah. So it, it puts us in this double bind. We can't win either way. Um, but we don't, we don't have to have that way. I think the key thing is, is virality, dangerous virality. Uh, we actually know like, from Facebook's own research that came out that, it, that Francis put forward, that the, the more viral something is, again, the, the more likely it was to be crazy. It's like, if you go back, I don't know if you remember like in the 90s when you get like a crazy email from your aunt and it had forward, colon, forward, colon, forward, like forward, 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 forward. The things that were forwarded from our crazy family members those were the, the crazy you know, newsletters, like the kind of the chain letter thing. For the record, I never got crazy things from my family until Facebook. Until Facebook. They right. never e I never got an email from my aunt, right. ever. Well, and that's the thing is it, it, it makes, it, it really shows us, I mean, another way to say it is that Facebook's business model is ruining Thanksgiving because their business model is to show each of us the, our own rabbit hole, our own Truman Show, our own reality. And when you show up at the Thanksgiving dinner table, like the family doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But that same thing that happens at Thanksgiving dinner, that happens to our government because this thing is also controlling and shaping the minds of our, our politicians. And so it makes it so we can't agree on anything. And that's really the danger, because no matter what you care about, climate change, racial justice, inequality, all of those things depend on a shared reality. And so if Facebook and, and these other companies, if they break shared reality, we can't do the other things. But the, the good news is if we deal with this problem, it gives us leverage to deal with the other problems. Why does it feel like social media is that friend, that, that's, that, ye that yes man around you, that's always telling you what you want to hear? Like you can just think something or say right. something, it just pops up on your phone. Totally. Well, it's like, so, you know, to get attention, do I do better at getting attention if I say, you know what, you're right. All these things you said in the past, here's more evidence of your right. That's going to that's gonna be way better at getting your attention than if I say, that thing that you believe, well, here's like a, a counter example. It's more complicated than that. Or here's like a 12 page research study. You're like, I don't want to click on that. So when we keep clicking on the stuff that confirms and doubles down on our confirmation bias, that's what, that's what keeps us clicking. But it does that for everyone. So whether you think, you know, you know, the vaccine is great or the vaccine is horrible or masks work or masks don't work, every side gets infinite evidence that they're right. And so we become more and more convinced that we're right and we have less and less empathy for what other people have seen because they have a different Truman Show reality. Wow. So it's, it breaks empathy. You break down how social media is feeding off our negative emotions. Talk about that a little more. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I mean, here, here's an example. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you post a photo uh, or you post something on, on the line and you get 100 comments, right, and 99 of the comments are positive, but one of them is negative, where does your attention go? That one fuck boy. <laughs> exactly. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and, and do you think that you're alone in that? Or do you think like the whole, we, we all work that Yeah, way. we all do that. Yeah. Right, exactly. And so this is about the universal aspects of human nature. And that's one of the negative emotions. And, we're, and, and do we look at it once or do we just like loop on it, right? You, you put your phone away and you're still thinking to yourself, like it consumes your day. So it's like, it's this huge cloud that's kind of taken over society. 
And um, you know, it's just, it's just not compatible with democracy working. All right, last question. Uh, do, do you think Francis Haugen's testimony is going to have consequences for these companies or will we just forget this happened tomorrow because Facebook will flush it out with something else? Well, I'm glad you brought that up, actually. They have a project, Facebook has a thing called Project Amplify that started in the last month that um, they actually amp up positive stories about Facebook right now. It's because they want to, like, up, upregulate their oh own image. God. And they control what people feel and think. So if they do that and they say, oh, you like horses, here's an example where Facebook helps someone who lost their horse find their horse because they posted it on some board. So they can keep upregulating their perception while screwing over the rest of us, right? So I, what I do think, though, just to answer your question, is that Francis, I think, really did an amazing thing in that both sides, the, the you know, Republicans and the Democrats, came together and said, this is a threat to our democracy. And that's never happened before. I've been working on this for eight years, mm -hmm. and I really saw something change there. Now, whether we can keep the pressure going, that's another question. Like you said, we can't let the, you know, the engine just distract us again. But I do think that we, we can get there. Wow, uh, Tristan, if you go missing, we're going to raid Facebook headquarters, man. That's All right. Uh, thank you, Tristan, for helping us unpack the problem. Now, my next guest is going to give us some tips on how we can seek salvation from this social media damnation. He's a professor of computer science at Georgetown University, the host of the Deep Questions podcast, and a New York Times bestselling author of one of my favorite books, Digital Minimalism. Make some noise for my man, Cal Newport. <laughs> Cal, good evening, sir. Good to talk to you again. I know, man. You know, I read your book a couple years ago. I never realized how hard it is to pronounce minimalism out loud, though, until tonight. Now, you know, I don't like having uh, shows where we just discuss problems. I like to discuss solutions. Your book is full of solutions. So how can people begin to disconnect from social media? Well, it really is the key question, and it's a hard one. Uh, it should be easy. Just use social media less. But people really struggle with it. And a couple things I think is helpful is to recognize first that there are people out there who don't use a lot of social media or maybe don't use it at all, and they're fine. And we have to get that message out there, not just people like me. There's teenagers who don't use it. There's artists. There's business people who don't use it. We need to normalize that. And then second, we have to recognize that for a lot of people, this is helping them avoid difficult things in their lives. Looking at that screen compulsively keeps you away from that void that might be distressing. So sometimes the most effective first step to disconnecting is actually focusing on filling in that void first and adding into your life stuff that you like to do better, more valuable stuff, more mission-driven stuff. Heal your life. It's easier to heal your relationship with the device. That's easy for us because we old. So we remember life before social media. <laughs> what about these kids who all they know is social media forever? You know, we don't need, let's say, everyone in a classroom to stop using social media before it feels like that's appropriate for the one kid we care about. All we really need is two or three people doing that. We just have to normalize that that is an allowable path. Because what I'm hearing from teenagers is the same thing that those leaked documents from Facebook are reporting. Teenagers know this is making them unhappy. Teenagers know that this is a problem. Teenagers feel trapped. We just have to show them there is a path out. And you're not going to be the very first person to take it. I think if we open that door, a lot of people are going to move through it. How did you feel when, like, social media went down recently? Yeah, you know, I'll tell you, the, the quote your show, the God's honest truth here, I didn't know at first because I don't use social media. My day was completely normal. But the next day I began to hear from readers, I began to hear from listeners, and I'll tell you, the most common reaction I heard from them was actually relief. You lie. It was a day where there was nothing there waiting for me on that screen to stare at. Wow. Relief. I wonder what that felt like for them. Like, what, what, did, what were they relieved by? I got to tell you, when you step away from these screens, the social media feed being a major part of your life, the default activity, it's almost like taking off a fogged pair of glasses. I mean, you hear the birds. Your anxiety goes down. Everything gets calmer. You begin to appreciate the people you're talking to. You begin to appreciate the book you're reading or the music you're listening to. I mean, it's almost like a drug that gives you only positive benefits. So I think it was probably a good experiment for a lot of people to see, even for just a day. What's it like when your day is not dominated by constantly swiping and constantly tapping? Mm. I like how in digital minimalism, you talk about uh, social media as a tool. And you say we should treat it as such. Break that down. Figure out first 
what you care about, what do you want to spend your time doing, what's important, and only then ask, how do I want to actually deploy technology to help these things that matter? So when you are deploying technology to support something you specifically care about, that is a completely different experience than just using TikTok or using Snapchat or using Twitter just as a default. Get intentional about how you use this tech and the amount of time you use it and the footprint it has in your life, it tends to get much, much smaller. Are we in too deep? Can we turn this thing around, man? Or, or, is, or is it up to regulation over individual behavior? I think us, the users, have a lot of power here. And the reason is, is that for most people, social media is not a fundamental technology in their life. They don't depend on it to get to work in the morning. They don't depend on it to feed their kids. We've seen people shift drastically from one platform to another almost seemingly overnight as the zeitgeist changes. So I think it's completely possible that if the culture around social media use changes, if it becomes something that's looked at as uh, not desirable, if it's something that looks like you're being exploited or controlled, we could see almost overnight the reach of these companies get much, much smaller. They are not as fundamental as they think. We as the users have the power. We do not have to put up with this narrative that if you're not on these devices all day, that somehow you don't exist. I call nonsense on that. We can say no. You make this sound so easy. <laughs> I'm serious, man. Have you ever seen somebody try to stop smoking crack or stop doing heroin <laughs> or stop smoking cigarettes? Like, I really feel like social media is that strong. Well, it does have a grip on us, but it's not that bad because it doesn't actually have a substance that crosses the blood-brain barrier. So it's what psychologists call a moderate behavioral addiction, which means if it's there, I'm going to do it more than I know is good or healthy for me. But if you take it away, I mean, even if you just take the apps off your phone and say, I'm not quitting, I'm still going to use all these services, but I'm going to do it on a computer and I'm going to have to type in my password like it's 1995, even if you just take it out of your immediate range, you'd be surprised by how much more little you use it. It's incredibly powerful, but we can get away from it, I think, easier than we think if we're strategic about it. What about people who find it uncomfortable or difficult to leave? Can you talk about life after leaving social media? What the hell am I gonna do without my smartphone, cow? I guess you'll read my book or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> we'll look at the glass. Um, And then we'll, uh, then we'll take a picture and tag it. But, <laughs> no, but, uh, here's what it's like when you're not on social media. At first, it is uncomfortable because you don't know what to do with your attention. If, however, you can fill in that time, and do this very intentionally, this is not easy, but actually say, here's what I want to do instead. Here's how I want to fill my time. Here's what's important to me. I'm going to get involved in different things. I'm going to go talk to people in person. I'm going to pick up new hobbies. I'm going to be useful to my community. If you put in that effort, life becomes much richer. And that urge to keep looking down, it'll be there for about 14 days. And then it goes away. And then you can look around you and say, oh, there's a lot more that I wasn't noticing before. So I can tell you from experience and the experience of thousands of people that I know who have done this, there is life on the other side of constant phone use, and it's a pretty good one. Kyle, that's just a nice way of saying, get a fucking life. <laughs> Thank you, Kyle. I appreciate you, bro.